Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes for the Clark College Network Technology Department. This is the CCNA Security course in Tech 225. We're covering Chapter 3 today, AAA, Authentication, Authorization, and Accounting. Let's get started. I haven't pointed out before, but these uh, numbers in our chapter outlines correspond directly to your online ebook. So as you're reading the online book, you'll see it's organized by the same section numbers, making it convenient for you to match this lecture up in your notes to your reading. Section 3.1, the purpose of AAA. When we're done with this section, you'll be able to explain why AAA is critical to network security and also describe the characteristics of AAA. Let's look at the overview. You need to have authentication. That's the first A. You need to authenticate your users. Without authentication, it's just what we call an open system, right? So no one's checking who anyone is. There's no usernames and passwords. Uh, it would be like a computer where you didn't have to log in. You could just sit down and, and do things. Use the web browser, use uh, Word or different kinds of uh, things on a system. And um, generally, you don't have that. Generally, you want to have some type of authentication. This slide is really kind of mismatched with that, right? It's not authentication without AAA. It's using an authentication method that is insecure. So here it is actually authentication. Telnet does have an authentication. It's optional. You can set up Telnet without authentication, but here we have authentication and um, it's just insecure because Telnet sends everything in plain text. So it's vulnerable to different types of attacks. Uh, it, says Telnet is vulnerable to brute force attacks, but that's another matter. Uh, the Telnet main vulnerability is that it's plain text, meaning it can be snooped on through something like Wireshark. And so any kind of packet sniffer can pick up the password that you're entering. And then it's uh, subject to man in the middle attacks and someone would know your password, they can log in as you and so forth. A brute force attack is generally when they keep trying all, all the um, possible passwords. and. Uh, Telnet's not the only protocol that is susceptible to a brute force attack. SSH is uh, more secure, and SSH adds encrypted usernames and passwords. So it's going to send your login information as an encrypted payload. This means that someone listening on Wireshark, for instance, would just see a bunch of garbly goof. They wouldn't be able to discern what your username and password is. And this is showing the steps in the lower slide. If you don't have those in your notes already, I would create a little recipe for SSH, and that's the recipe there. That's everything you need to um, put SSH on a device. You do have to additionally set the host name. So it, I would add that one at the top. You need host name R1. You know, you have to set the host name to something and then use these steps, and that's the complete recipe to set up um, SSH. They've adapted it a little bit. If you look at username, and we talked about this in the last chapter, they are changing the hashing algorithm from MD7. So they're not using an MD7 or an MD5 write secret. If they had used username admin secret strong password, that secret would indicate an MD5 hash. What they've done is chosen the script algorithm instead of the MD5. And you can do that so you can modify your encryption algorithm. All right, there are three components to AAA. First, we want to authenticate the user. Authentication is simply, who are you? It's usually accomplished through username and password. If you were a human being walking in, getting authenticated, uh, we could do it by your fingerprint or by a driver's license, some picture ID, something of that nature. That's examples of authentication. Authorization is once we've identified who you are, we can look up what you're allowed to do. What are your rights and privileges and what are your restrictions? So typically that's what we would call account information. In a Windows server, that would be sometimes called group policies. In a Cisco device, we often call that ACLs, access control list, which might limit what you're allowed to do based on who you are. And again, the authentication 
could be your IP address, could be your device uh, MAC or IP address. So it, it's uh, not always a human identifier. Sometimes we're identifying a device, but most always, whether it's a device or a human, we prefer a username and password or a passcode. And finally, accounting, uh, which is really just logging. We want to know what you did. Once we know who you are and what you're allowed to do, we want to keep track of what you did do and what you attempted to do that you weren't allowed to do and was denied. So we usually keep a log of the, or a record of everything you did. This is usually time and date stamped and uh, includes at some level, every command you type on every device, every failed um, login attempt and th those type of things. Everywhere you may ping, every response you got back from a ping, that kind of thing. Uh, you can adjust how much information you're accounting. You could account for less or more, but some type of accounting is usually important in terms of uh, the AAA. Let's take a look at some characteristics of AAA. We have some authentication modes. You can either authenticate locally or on a server-based authentication. What this means is locally on the device itself, on your Windows PC, on your Cisco router, on your switch, you would keep a local list of usernames and passwords. And when someone attempts to log into that device, you would check that local database and uh, validate the user. Using server-based authentication, is uh, similar to what we sometimes call SSO or single sign-on. And the idea is that you would keep one central list of all the usernames and passwords for your organization on a server. Uh, in the Microsoft realm, they call this an AD or Active Directory Server. In the Linux world, this would be called an LDAP server. And this directory server would be able to provide uh, validation of login attempts on devices that are connected to the server. So if you were to log into a router, say, it would forward your login information, your username, password to this directory server, and it would validate it by looking it up. And if it was there and matched, it would say, yep, that's, a, that's an allowed user. And it would send a, a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, back to the device saying, yes, this user is authorized or this user is not or authenticated. Authorization is the next piece. Once you're authenticated, um, the central server or the local database, if you have local um, access control lists or uh, you might have privilege levels locally, you might set up um, privilege levels so that that would be the authorization. Different users are assigned different privilege levels would be an example of local authorization. Or if you're a privilege level one, you can only get to the user mode prompt, for example. And if you're a privilege mode 15, which is the default for accounts on a Cisco device, you would have full run of the device. If you include a server and you're doing that remote authorization, it's going to send back a list of what is allowed and what is not allowed. And I might even granularly be checking as you try things um, to see if those things are authorized. Finally, the accounting or logging. Uh, one, one example of accounting is syslog. So on a Cisco device, we often set up a remote syslog server to um, keep track of what everyone does. We can alternatively log things locally right in the RAM of the device, but RAM's a pretty limited commodity and it's very vulnerable because if you have a hacker um, gain access to the device, all they need to do is reboot the device when they're done to clear out all those logs because they're not kept in a permanent storage medium. So it's preferable to set up a syslog server and you can set one up on any device, even an old PC will work fine. Usually I get a uh, large capacity, uh, slow hard drive, like a one terabyte, you know, um, 5200 spin hard drive. You can pick those up usually for 50, 60 bucks put it in an old PC that really isn't worth anything, uh, you know, an old uh, Pentium 4 even, and put some Linux or Windows on it. With Windows, you can download the free Kiwi syslog server. We have that installed in our lab and in NetLab for you, and that's what you'll be using in this class as an example of a logging server. But you can also get fancy software to handle the accounting for you, and we'll be looking at some of that in this class. Some of the software that you can get and download um, allows you to do all the AAA. It'll handle everything from the authentication to the authorization to the accounting. 
All right, let's look at local authentication specifically. When we're done with this section, you'll be able to configure AAA authentication locally using the command line interface to validate users against the local database. You'll also be able to troubleshoot AAA authentication that validates users against a local database. So here we're adding usernames and passwords to the local router database for users that need administrative access to the router. And as a note, you could do the same activity on a switch. You then, after um, you've added that or before, you um, type AAA new model. And what this does is activate the AAA. Okay. And then you can add any extra parameters that you want. In this case, we are using the default database. So this says AAA authentication login default. And so it's saying to use the default database to um, log in users. Okay, and here is a description of some of those keywords that we used. Here's a look at setting up other types of authentication. So we're setting up an SSH login authentication and notice this is a little different than what we've done previously in labs. We used to type under our VTY lines, login local, and that used the local or default um, database. So login authentication SSH login is saying use, use the SSH login database. It's just using the AAA, where the, the other approach that we used previously, you didn't have to type AAA new model. If you remember setting up SSH, uh, earlier in other classes or in the recipe that was provided a few slides ago, AAA new model was not required. But if we're going to use uh, AAA, we can go ahead and use it on our VTY lines as well so that everything is going through our AAA authentication. Now you can see with AAA, we have a whole lot more data about the login process. I can take a look at you know, who's locked out, I can look at who's currently logged in, and I can see a lot of information about them, how long they've been logged in, what their IP address is, diff different kinds of, of things. Let's talk about troubleshooting some local AAA authentication. So when we want to debug local AAA authentication, we can have a lot of options. Don't type debug AAA, that would do all of these. We want to debug AAA, say, authentication. Let's say someone's unable to log in. They're like, I don't get it, I can't log in. We go, okay, well, that's cool. Let's take a look at what's actually happening when you hit that enter key. What is the router doing with that information? Why is it failing out? And we'd be able to see that in great detail. You notice you could also look at the authorization phase, or we could look at um, even more specific uh, information if we wanted to. And you'll get plenty of information as shown here, even with this very specific authentication piece. In a lab, you're going to get this based on a single user trying to log in. Okay, this is one user trying to log in here and you're getting the, um, the attempts. Each attempt as they log in, it's tracking what, uh, what the router is doing with that login information. If you had a production router with you know hundreds of people logging in and out, this might get um, this might get pretty crazy. So debug is not always the most usable information to uh, sort through and use. It's kind of a, a last ditch. I like to use debug as a gee, we just can't figure this out with show commands. Let's go and do a debug. And it may take some time. You may have to put your debug into a separate file and take some time. Um, using the find filter in a, like a notepad document to be able to go through and um, figure out what's really going on. Let's talk about server-based AAA now. We talked about the local authentication and authorization. Let's talk about server-based. 
we'll be talking about um, the benefits of server-based AAA. I already alluded that would be single sign-on, right? Not having separate usernames and passwords kept locally on each device, where if you had to change your password, you'd have to log into each device and change it. And you could end up with inconsistency. I've had that in jobs where different devices have the older password because it hasn't been updated and the um, newer password other places. And so you end up with password inconsistency and other issues. We'll also compare TACAX and RADIUS, which are two authentication protocols used to allow devices, AAA devices, to communicate with the AAA server. Let's talk about the server-based characteristics. Okay, with local authentication, the user establishes a connection with the local device and the local device prompts the user for username and password and uses the local database to validate or verify that information. With server-based authentication, you have the same kind of the user establishes a connection with the local device and the local device prompts the user for username and password. But now this is where it goes in step three, the local device will now pass the username and password off to a, a remote server using either um, TACAX or RADIUS as the protocol that's used to do that. And then the server will authenticate the user with a thumbs up or thumbs down. So they'll look up that account information and verify the username and password. And if it checks out, they'll send a, yep, that's, that checks out. Or they'll send a, no, denied. And that's how that works a little more uh, back and forth. And one of the complexities that we'll have to set up is that link between the local device and the remote server. That's where, again, we'll use TACAX or RADIUS. That will be the protocol that allows AAA devices to communicate to a AAA server. Here's a comparison of TACAX Plus and RADIUS. Also should be mentioned, there's something called TACAX, which is actually an open standard. Here, they're talking about TACAX Plus, which is mostly Cisco supported. Um, it is used by companies like AT&T and a lot of the telecommunications industry and major internet service providers tend to prefer TACAX. TACAX is a um, mostly Linux, uh, Unix-based uh, solution uh, connecting into the LDAP directory service where RADIUS can connect into a Microsoft Windows server into the Active Directory, or both of these uh, can be connected into proprietary third-party software. You can purchase software applications to run on any OS to um, act as your AAA server, and most of those will support one or both of these protocols. You can see the major differences. TACAX uh, is TCP based, so it's more resilient for WAN connections in the internet where uh, TCP is preferred, and RADIUS is UDP based where it is going to be uh, more efficient in terms of faster, higher efficiency, especially in a LAN environment. So RADIUS is more customized for a LAN environment where TACAX is uh, said to be more of a WAN environment um, protocol. And you can see that you have uh, differences with the CHAP. Authentication is bi-directional with TACAX and unidirectional with the RADIUS. Um, you have multi-protocol support with TACAX. You do not with RADIUS. You have more limited protocol support. You can see in terms of confidentiality, TACAX encrypts the entire packet. RADIUS does not. Radius is easier to configure, by the way. It has less parameters, so TACAX is more complex, can track way more things. It's logging, in terms of its accounting feature, is far superior to Radius. But Radius is usually much easier to set up and get working, and so if you don't need all that complexity, uh, Radius is, is generally the one we go with. I personally like uh, the program-free Radius, which is free, and runs in both Windows and Linux, Unix, and Mac. And free radius uh, allows you to run a radius server for doing AAA. So I think these are backwards here on the bottom where it says the accounting is limited for TACAX and extensive for radius. I think a simple Wikipedia, I would encourage you to go to Wikipedia and look up both of these. And I think you will see that TACAX has much uh, superior accounting than radius does. TACAX was developed uh, for the phone industry and it has uh, way more extensive accounting. So I think those are kind of flipped around there at the bottom. But nonetheless, you could use either one to get the job done, right? In the basic concept, they both do the same thing. 
They both are a conduit for sending a username and password to a server for remote authentication and then sending the result back. And then of course doing the authorization and accounting pieces as well. Okay. And this is looking at the difference. Notice how fewer steps there are with radius authentication. So there's the radius part is going to be between um, you know router 2 and the ACS server, right? So if we go back here, you can see that the TACX part between R2 and ACS is much more extensive. Okay, so the steps between the client and R2 uh, don't involve radius or TACX, so they remain identically the same. They're essentially the same. Their order changes because of the additional back and forth steps on the right side of the slides. So you might want to review that when you're doing your reading, kind of understand the difference in terms of the back and forth communication. So radius obviously is going to be a lot faster because it has less communications back and forth. It gets its job done quicker, and it uses the far more efficient UDP protocol. Also, it only encrypts certain information, so it's faster in terms of CPU utilization as well. Right. All right. So this is just showing integration with Active Directory. The prior slide showed integration with the proprietary Cisco ACS server. We'll be using a Cisco ACS server in some of the labs in our class. We've got some of the NetLab labs set up with a Cisco ACS server and you'll be using accounts uh, created on that server. It has a web-based interface. You just log in, create accounts, and then you can uh, authenticate and authorize against those accounts with your remote a AAA device. Uh, we won't be doing things with the Microsoft Active Directory, but if you're um, taking a Microsoft degree program or taking the Microsoft server courses, it would be pretty cool to have your router or switch integrated with your Active Directory. Let's talk then about server-based AAA authentication. So when we're done with this section, you'll be able to configure server-based AAA authentication using the command line interface, and you'll be able to troubleshoot some server-based authentication issues. So here's the steps. First, you need to turn on AAA and then specify the IP address of the remote server that's going to be doing this verification. Then you have to configure a shared secret key, a key that the server has for this device that the device also has to use as a way to tell the server it is that device. Okay, And then we're going to configure authentication to use either the RADIUS or TACX protocol. So here's how you do it. In a nutshell, you just turn on AAA, and then in this case, we're setting a TACX server. And we give it a name, whatever kind of nickname you want to give it, like TACX server, my server, or, um, you know, I don't know, uh, my AD or whatever name you want to give that thing. And then it takes you to a sub prompt where you can provide the IP address, and that could be an IPv4 or an IPv6 address, depending on your network topology. And in this case, it will be a single connection, and then this is the shared secret key, and that's, that's all there is to it. And this is doing it with radius. Notice it's pretty much identically the same here in terms of our configuration. We are specifying particular ports in this case uh, because remember that our radius server is using UDP. So these are specifying some UDP ports that are going to be used by the radius server. Okay. This is some command syntax for just setting up our, our login group. Okay. Notice here we are setting up both a TACX and a RADIUS server. So a single device could be connected to both a TACX and a RADIUS server. So you might have two authentication servers. And what will happen in this case is it will try to authenticate against the, the, the first one. And if that fails, it will try to authenticate against the second one. It's quite possible in a large organization that you might actually have two different databases or directories of users and passwords. 
and you may not have it all um, combined together. Like uh, for instance, sometimes we'll have accounts on a Unix machine um, for users in one part of the organization and we might have accounts on a Microsoft AD for users in another part of the organization. This happens when companies merge and so forth. So this allows a single device to be connected to more than one authentication server. Let's talk about troubleshooting your server-based authentication. Well, again, they're using debug. Hopefully you won't have to go here. Debug generates a lot of information and it's pretty cryptic. It's difficult to read and understand. But here we're debugging some AAA authentication. And so it's going to be looking now at the messages the device, in this case R1, is sending the authentication server and the messages that it's getting back. And you can see, here's that thumbs up, thumbs down. In this case, we got a thumbs up. It says response status pass. If it said response status fail, then it would say, no, I can't find that username password. So this attack X plus message that's been sent, an authentication message, and it's contingent on approval. And now it received a response back that says, yeah, that was a valid username password. And that completes uh, essentially the authentication phase of um, TACX. It's important to note that TACX does authentication separate from authorization. So it would have another phase that would occur right after this that wouldn't be debugged. You'd have to debug AAA authorization to see that separately. Okay. And here you can debug your radius. Okay, and this is showing the difference between a successful authentication and a failed authentication. And that just draws your attention to that line I showed you in the earlier slide. Uh, that's the first thing I look for is, did it pass? And if it says fail, then you know we want to kind of figure out why the, it failed and we can kind of look at the, other, at the other information, but it's clearly getting there and getting back so we don't have a connectivity issue. Likely, the username or password is not what is recorded in the directory um, server. It's either the wrong case or there's an extra space or there's some type of um, you know, difference in the data. Let's talk about authorization and accounting. When we're done with this section, you'll be able to configure authorization and accounting. And we'll talk a little about 8021X components, which is something coming from the uh, wireless world. So wireless LAN, you know, Wi-Fi, has an authentication mechanism called 8021X that we can also use on our wired line devices. Remember that authentication is just making sure an end user or end device is legitimate. Authorization allows or disallows devices to do certain things. Also remember that TACAX separates the authentication from the authorization process. RADIUS combines them. Just differences. Here's your command syntax. Here are some authorization method lists. So notice we're typing AAA authorization. So we're setting up some local authorization and we can create some groups. Again, we can assign users to these groups. This is much like the concept uh, in Windows or Unix where you can create groups and have users in groups. And in Windows, they call that group policy, policies that are assigned to the group. So here we're able to do the same thing. Let's talk about server-based. That was doing it locally. Now we have a server-based approach. Okay. This is just setting it up on a Cisco device. Again, you could actually have one device, one router acting as AAA server and another router acting as AAA client. Not commonly done. Usually your AAA server is always going to be a Windows or Linux machine either the operating system handling the AAA directly or more likely using some third-party software on top of that operating system to accomplish the functions of AAA. Let's talk about 8021X. So this is a pretty cool protocol. This is baked into you know, cell phones and Macs and Windows PCs and laptops 
And essentially what happens is when a device plugs into an 802.1x network, so it's port-based authentication, so that could be plugging in wirelessly, so connecting to a wireless um, access point, or it could be connecting to a wireline port, plugging into a wall port, so forth. It prompts the device for a username and password. A little pop-up, usually in the, in the tray, in the desktop tray, comes up and says, hey, uh, you've been requested to enter your username and password. You enter the same username and password, usually single sign-on, that is your username and password for, you know, for the company or the organization. And it would then authorize that device. So you could take any device you have and get it authorized on the network. So port-based authentication. So there's your authenticator, a switch, wireless access point, something of that nature. Again, this is port-based, so each port on the switch um, is going to be connected to what they call a supplicant, which is an end device, which um, must authenticate. And it will get prompted through an 802.1x message sent to the supplicant that says, hey, I need your username and password. And the device will prompt the user for it. And most devices have an option. You check a little box that says, yeah, I want you to go ahead and cache or retain this, allowing the device to seamlessly connect in the future without you having to be prompted. It's a pretty cool little protocol. And of course, that's then shuttled off using AAA to the authentication server and then approved. So the authenticator is acting just like the router was acting in the earlier slides, and it's making sure that the supplicant devices are authenticated so that they can um, get on the network and do what they want to do. And you can see the protocols that are used here. We use um, EAP, e which is the protocol that is going to be used um, for 802.1x to communicate, and then EAP and RADIUS are used uh, to communicate uh, between the authenticator and the server. And this is just the commands for setting it up. So this is a lab you're going to do. It's pretty cool. And when you plug in your PC, it'll just pop up with a message in the tray that says you have to authenticate this uh, connection. And the link will stay amber until you do that. It'll not be green. You won't be able to uh, ping or pull up a web page or do anything until you've you know authenticated. This is kind of similar to in, in, in Wi-Fi. This happens on your phone a lot. When you enter a Wi-Fi network, you have to join the network and put in your credentials. This is that same kind of thing being extended to a wireline situation. This is just the commands to get that set up. And we're not going to go through them all. You have a lab where uh, they have these, and also it's in your ebook when you'll be reading. It's much more interesting to actually configure this and see it work. All right, as a summary for this chapter, we explained how AAA is used to secure the network. We implemented AAA authentication that validates users against a local database. We also implemented server-based AAA using both TACAX and RADIUS protocols, and we configured server-based AAA authorization and accounting.